song, James Bond. My friends call me James Bond. Boys with toys. And welcome back to another ranking video. This time, of course, we're going to rank the films of Pierce Brosnan. The days are getting shorter. The nights are getting longer. Uh, it's getting cool outside. So maybe it's a good time to curl up with a good old Bond movie that you haven't watched in a while. And uh, Pierce Brosnan might really hit the spot. Uh, and it's around this time that you start to notice that after Sean Connery, who had a lengthy tenure, after Roger, who also had a very lengthy tenure, Pierce didn't get as many films. There's not as many films to rank. So I decided why not use this time to talk about some of the Bonds that didn't get a ranking. George Lazenby, of course, did one James Bond film, and you already know that this is one of the films that I absolutely adore. It has stayed in the top spot for many years, only to be rivaled by Casino Royale many years later. I think George does an excellent job in this film, despite his lack of experience. And I really wish he stuck around and did a few more, because I think you really could have gotten some great films and some great performances out of George Lazenby. On Her Majesty scored a 10 out of 10 for me. It's one of only two films that was able to achieve that in my book. It's a great classic James Bond film. If you haven't watched it in a while, especially with Christmas coming, give it another watch. Which also, of course, leaves the films of Timothy Dalton. Again, a guy who only did two films. Hard to do a ranking video of those, uh, but let's give a quick recap of what I thought about these films. Timothy did one of my most favorite Bond films along with one of my least favorite Bond films, but the one I absolutely love is The Living Daylights. My theory goes that when you bring in a new James Bond, it tends to highlight the elements of Bond that makes him unique. I love what Timothy brings to the table, and this film has the charm, charisma, great locations, a little romance, all the things I really want from a James Bond film. The Living Daylights took us back to a time of Ian Fleming. The opening sniper scene is right from the short story, The Living Daylights, and the whole film continues to hold on to this Cold War tone. Not a perfect film, not perfect villains, but boy is this a good watch. I gave this film a 9 because I absolutely adore it. If you haven't seen it recently, check it out. But Dalton's follow-up, License to Kill, got a score of 3 out of me. I don't hate this film and I know a lot of fans really do like it. And I can see why. It does give us that tough grittiness that we want from James Bond. There are elements right out of Fleming. It was the first gritty revenge tale we ever got before it became fashionable. And I get all those things, but somehow they seem to drop the ball. The movie feels small. It feels like a made-for-TV movie. It was trying to be a typical 80s action film with its drug dealer villain. And I get that drug dealing makes for a convincing villain, but this film is totally lacking the elegance I like from James Bond. Even the scenes with Bond in the tux in the casino somehow just feels real cheap. This is one of those films I might need to give another watch to. Really kind of give it a fresh look with fresh eyes. Eh, but for me, it was kind of a weak follow-up after such a great intro with A Living Daylight, so... Yeah, sorry, this one gets a three. Alright, but the main event, we're here to talk about Pierce Brosnan, who again did four James Bond films. Uh, and interestingly, a lot of these films feel very similar to me. Uh, I ranked a lot of these films, three of them, got the same exact score when I did my ranking videos. Uh, but I do feel that there are nuances that, that would kind of like still put one slightly above the other. Uh, although some of it can be really interchangeable. The first one though, unfortunately, really does stand out. And I think most people will agree with this. Uh, a lot of Bond fans who adore James Bond and will really go to bat to defend even some of the weakest ones still struggle with this one. So you know what I'm talking about. Uh, I gave it a score of one. I only did that for two films in my ranking videos. Uh, this in, this one is just one of the worst. There's not a lot of redeeming things about it. Uh, I'll get into it. Let's talk about it. You guessed it. Die another day. 
Some Bond fans have called this the best of times and the worst of times, meaning that the first half of the film is really good and the second half really drops off. But personally, I think people are being really generous when they say that the first half is pretty good. The opening scene is a mixed bag, but it ends on a note of promise. There are elements here that feels like classic James Bond, other elements that just feel silly, feel like classic shoot 'em up explosions with really cheesy taglines. Saved by the bell. The idea of Bond in captivity for 14 whole months, that was something we hadn't seen before. So we were right to get excited for this. We were right to think this was gonna be something different, but boy, does he shake it off real quick. Before you know it, we forgot this even happened. That's really the overall problem with the whole film. It's the weird contradiction in tone. It can't decide if it wants to be dark, realistic, and gritty, or wild, over-the-top fantasy fun, so it just does both. So even at its better moments, you walk away with mixed feelings at best. Like, how are you supposed to feel when James Bond is being tortured by scorpions while you're listening to an upbeat Madonna dance track? Now don't get me wrong, Bond strolling into the hotel lobby, long hair, beard, soaking wet pajamas, with all the confidence you'd expect from James Bond. My usual suite, please. Now that's cool. I won't take anything away from this scene. I do enjoy the Cuba setting. I think Bond looks great. I've been drinking lots of mojitos since I saw this film, but what is it about Tamahori's direction here? It's like he told his actors to just look cool, and everyone's constantly posing for the camera, the dialogue is cringy. I think Halle Berry is wildly overrated. Your mama. And I just don't know what to make of her character. They try to make her real tough and badass, but a few seconds later she'll be a damsel in distress if the script needs her to be. And seriously, this uber tough character couldn't even convince my mother. Oh, come on, she's like 90 pounds soaking wet. I don't think Brosnan ever really got a great Bond girl. There was always a lack of chemistry, always a tendency to grab the American actress that was kind of hot at the time. It really doesn't do the films any favors. The pace, as with a lot of films in this era, is much too quick. And I totally agree. Once you get to the Ice Palace, everything just feels cartoonish. In fact, once you get to whatever this is, the hologram training sequence, this is meant to appeal to the video game generation. And again, it just takes us right into the world of science fiction. Which brings me, of course, to... I mean, you have to be kidding, and I don't care what anybody says. There might be similar technology that can do things like this, but I'm gonna let Top Gear respond to this one. If I turn this switch here, everything changes. Invisibility cloak, descend. I have simply vanished. Yep, totally transparent. Yeah, I mean, it's just one silly quip after another, one comic book scene after another. And of course, I haven't even mentioned this part yet. I mean, there you go. That kind of just sort of sums up the whole thing for me. The whole thing is just one silly, childish scene after another. It really does nothing for me. It, it doesn't elevate the Bond franchise at all, as far as I'm concerned. So, yeah, I scored it a one, and that's about all I could say about Die Another Day. Which brings us to the other three Pierce Brosnan entries, which for me are oddly similar. I scored every one of these going forward a seven, uh, and again, I do feel like there's some little nuanced things in between that allows me to sort of judge which one is better than the other. But honestly, for the most part, these are very interchangeable. Uh, I find them to be very similar in, in quality. Uh, none of them are perfect. I feel like all of them suffer from flaws that keep them from being great films. Uh, and the one I'm going to put as my number three is probably going to surprise some people. So at number three, here we go. Goldeneye. Now, don't get me wrong, I think GoldenEye is a solid film. It's got all the elements people want from a James Bond film. It's a great introduction to Pierce Brosnan as James Bond. For me, I can't really connect with this film. I don't know exactly what it is. I've said it before and I'll say it again. This film to me feels like greatest hits. It's a film that seems to be in awe of the legacy of James Bond without actually taking daring steps. It sort of has this hands-off feel, like it doesn't want to mess with the formula. And maybe because of that, this feels more like a tribute to James Bond than an actual James Bond film itself. So again, it's got good elements, the locations are gorgeous, Brosnan looks good in everything he's wearing. 
The introduction of Judy Dench as M was a very clever move forward. Alec Trevelyan is a great Bond villain. I think easily the best Bond villain of the Brosnan tenure. He's that classic mirror image of James Bond. It doesn't have a lot of great action scenes, but what it does have is organic. It's organic to the story. The action doesn't seem wedged in here. Jack Wade steps in as kind of the new Felix Leiter, and he's fine. So for the most part, the film is working. There's a few problems that, yeah, they're not big problems, but yeah, I just sort of noticed them. For example, why is the BMW in this movie? It literally serves no function whatsoever. It's pure product placement. And as most fans have noticed, the score is weird. A lot of fans have wondered what this film would be like if it had a David Arnold score. I definitely think that could have been a big improvement. Eric Serra is a fine composer, but I think his work here is not clicking. Xenia is a big favorite amongst GoldenEye fans. For me, she was always a little over the top and eh, just trying a little too hard. The Bond girl here is great, but I've always found it kind of ironic that for a film franchise that's well known for gorgeous Bond girls in glamorous and often revealing clothing, this one spends a lot of the film in this dingy cardigan sweater. It goes with the story, but it's just kind of one of those things you notice. They took a stunning actress and they really seem to tone her down for this one. Again, kind of the opposite of what you'd expect from James Bond. The climax is fine, the fight scene is good, the resolution works. So all in all, this is not a bad film, but again, I just, I can't really feel it on a gut level. So while on paper, I think GoldenEye checks all the boxes, for me, I had to give it a seven, but I think a seven is perfectly respectable. So we're down to the last two Brosnan films, and like I said, especially these two are very interchangeable, and honestly, I sort of have a debate with myself fairly regularly which one is better, but I think there is a clear winner for me in terms of rewatchability, and, and for some reason I just kind of like it a little bit better. Uh, but let's talk about number two, again a fine film, Tomorrow Never Dies. Now Scott hates this one, and when I first saw it, I wasn't crazy about it either. One of the traits of the Brosnan films is that, with each new film, they seem to correct what was wrong before, but then they would make new mistakes. The correction in Tomorrow Never Dies was bringing in David Arnold to score the film. Arnold is a genius, and he is a genuine Bond fan, along with an amazing composer, and the work he does in the Bond films is tremendous. Where Tomorrow Never Dies goes wrong is the pacing. Kind of like another sophomore effort, Quantum of Solace, Tomorrow Never Dies seemed to want to up the pace, hit you with short bullet points and move on to the next scene quickly. We don't get a lot of time to smell the flowers in this one. The story is fine. This is sort of a modern retelling of the Goldfinger plot. A rich tycoon wants a monopoly. will go to any means to do so. In this case, we're going to start World War III, which again is fair game for a James Bond film. But it doesn't stand up to a lot of scrutiny, does it? What do you get? Me? Oh, nothing. Just exclusive broadcasting rights in China for the next hundred years. I mean, is that really a Bond plot? Is that something that would drive someone to mass murder? The idea of Bond running into an old flame was a pretty interesting idea. The series had been around for a while, so why not? but I wasn't really buying Terry Hatcher as Bond's lost love. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Master Magician Ricky J. Ricky! I thought Ricky J was interesting. I know he was meant to have more scenes that showed off some interesting talents, but with that gone, it doesn't leave you a whole lot. The Stamper character is straight out of the school of Red Grant, Eric Kriegler, Necros, you know, the blonde Aryan Superman, and this one kind of seems much more generic. The Dr. Kaufman scene is interesting. It's really good stuff. Frankly, I wish they had a different actor because this actor is very familiar to me and it kind of takes away a little of the tension, but I'll concede a lot of people like it and I can't argue with it. Wait, I'm just a professional doing a job. Me too. The action scenes are really good and combined with David Arnold's score are really a treat. The ending is kind of generic. Bond finds the stealth boat, the two go in, there are shootouts, a very standard trope of the heroine getting captured. So this is all fine. So again, there's a lot of really good stuff, but as usual, it gets over the top. It just, it's like there's always one scene in a Bond movie lately that you just roll your eyes at. 
So there you go. I gave it a seven. I think it's a solid Bond film. I think it's very watchable. Uh, again, not perfect. Again, Brosnan really never got a perfect James Bond film, but I think this one has a lot of entertaining things happening. I can easily sit down and watch it and enjoy it for what it is. So I think my seven is fair. Which brings us to my number one Pierce Brosnan film. Ironically, still with a score of seven. Uh, I feel like one of the most overused phrases of this ranking video is going to be the idea that Pierce never really got a great Bond film. He got solid entries, uh, very good scripts, uh, but never really hit greatness. Uh, but again, I think this one is my personal favorite of the bunch. Uh, I think there's a lot to really enjoy with it. Not perfect, and we'll talk about why, but I still think it's a pretty damn solid film. The world is not enough. Like I said earlier, the tendency for the Brosnans now was to fix things that were wrong in the last go around, but still not quite perfect. The film has a stellar opening. Pierce Brosnan is here to work. He's letting you know this is old school James Bond. The escape from the Swiss bank in Bilbao is fantastic. It's not over the top. It's not silly. It's pretty grounded. And of course the boat chase. What a great way to kick off this James Bond film. I watched this scene many times when I got this on DVD. Really good stuff. Bond's connection with Electric King is also really good. Now again, I like a Bond film with a good romance. And this film has just enough. And it's that classic Ian Fleming relationship where Bond finds himself wanting to protect a winged dove. So you can see how Bond is drawn in. You can see how Bond let his guard down. You start to get hints of Casino Royale in this one. Bond is so taken that it doesn't hit him that she could be playing him. It's not until Renard basically lets Bond know that he's been played that he puts the pieces together. I think the plot works. I think the story of the oil pipelines, this is very relevant to today's issues. It's another takeoff on Goldfinger where the villainess wants a monopoly. And this time with bigger, more tangible stakes than just ratings. I think Renard is a solid villain. I don't think he ever lives up to his full potential. And quite frankly, I think the whole part about him not feeling pain kind of gets forgotten. The action pieces are good, but they do feel really wedged in. Like they're not at all organic. For example, why is the cigar girl waiting outside just in case someone sticks their head out so she can fire a couple shots and escape? The film firmly establishes that King's lapel pin is what sets off the bomb. In other words, he set off the bomb that killed him. It was perfectly designed to detonate as soon as King comes in contact with the money so that no one needed to be present to detonate the bomb. So there's quite literally no reason for her to be here except to kick off a pretty awesome boat chase. I know, I know, don't overthink these things. Every so often we need a new action scene so something happens for some reason and it's okay. Judy Dench gets captured. I feel like that was a sort of trope from the 80s, 90s action movies that Bond hadn't done yet. So our new writers found it to be fair game. Are you here for a reason? Or are you just hoping for a glimmer? And of course you get Denise Richards playing a nuclear scientist. And what can I say about that that hasn't already been said? Yes, it was a miscast. And like a lot of the Brosnan films, they went for a actress who was very popular at the time. So why the hell not? But it didn't really help the story, at least didn't make it feel very believable. So where this film excels, it's got great action scenes. The score is magnificent. I know I already mentioned the boat chase, but honestly, it's a great idea for an action scene. Arnold's score here is perfect. I think his score here is one of the most quintessential scores in the whole franchise. And the fact that this takes place in a familiar place in London, I think this is gonna be a welcome trend going forward. Again, I enjoy the romance here. I like the double cross aspect, very Fleming-esque. I think Brosnan is absolutely at his peak performance in this film. I think it's the best Brosnan performance ever. I think the plot works fine and the overall look and feel works really well. So again, it's not a perfect film by any stretch. I feel like of all the Brosnans, I can a little more easily relate to it. Brosnan shows vulnerability here. You can feel him struggling a little bit to understand what's happening. So maybe that's why I identify with this one more. It's entertaining, it's solid, the score is great. So it's a very easy watch. So personally, I think this is Pierce Brosnan's best effort.
There you go. The films of Pierce Brosnan ranked. Again, I wish we had more from Pierce to be able to talk more about and do a little more of a ranking video. Uh, but I think we kind of explored it pretty well. And again, even though the top three are all very similar to each other, I think we were able to sort of stack them a little bit uh, in a logical way. Uh, which, of course, leaves us the films of Daniel Craig. Question. Do I wait for No Time to Die before I rank the films of Daniel Craig, or should I just go ahead and rank the four that we have right now? Let me know what you think, and let me know what you thought of this ranking. Do you think I'm crazy? Was I pretty hard on Goldeneye? I think a lot of people might think I was. But uh, but again, it's all personal opinion, and, and uh, just whichever one kind of grabs me a little more and why. Uh, but there you go. Uh, thank you, as always, for watching. Yours truly, Head of Section, will be here with more videos. Uh, please like this video. Please subscribe. All that good stuff. And as always, keep living like James Bond. And I will see you soon.